Hey everyone, welcome back to Homegrown Passion. So today I'm waiting for Nathan Donnelly from Crop King to come out and help me look at my tomatoes and see what's going on. But before I get to that, I'm checking on my beans and it's really cool. Let's see if I can show you some. Got some growing here. Look how big they're getting. Another week, they should be ready to be harvested. Oh, here's some even bigger ones. So my wall of beans is doing pretty good. Hi everybody. While Kate's in the back with Nathan working on tomatoes, I've got to get back into my shop and get all the maintenance stuff done on my equipment. I'm way far behind. I usually work on this in the winter time, but we've been doing so much stuff in the greenhouse that I haven't been doing this. And so I've got all the filters I've got to replace on this and actually I got most of it done. I got to change the oil and then go through all the grease joints and all that. So this is the excavator. I've got to do my skid stir. I've got a lot of stuff to do. So hope you have fun with Katie in the back. So what I want to talk to Nathan about is I have some discoloring of yellow down here on some of these bottom leaves and then I have some purplish colors on some of the upper leaves and then down here my new clusters usually they're way bigger than this because this is Rabolski it's a cultivar we've been growing I think this is our fifth or sixth year doing it and usually by now the tomatoes are a lot bigger so I'm not sure exactly what's going on so he's going to come out here and test my water and see what's going on all right so Nathan Donnelly with Crop King we're out here at Bradwood Farms um, doing some evaluation on these tomatoes here and so what we're seeing is that we're not getting nearly the fruit size that we've gotten in years past so the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to see where our runoff EC and pH is at in these buckets so I looked earlier we're running 2.0 for the EC so I'm going to go through and take a sampling from a few of these buckets by dipping them out then I'll take that collective sample put it into my cup and then we'll check it with the hand meter so in a perfect world what we would see is that we would see a EC no larger than 0.4 above the supply EC. So if I see something that's more than 2.4 in here, we're going to look at adjusting the time that we irrigate for. And maybe depending on what the number comes back at, we might look at bringing the EC back down. Or if we go through and see that our... Doug's got these tied in there real tight. Is there anything coming out of there? No. Hmm. Maybe I'm not giving enough water. That might be suspect number one. So I'm putting my finger down in here to see if feel how much moisture is in there. So if I put my finger down in there, you'll see that it's still coming out oh, yeah. pretty dry. So I'm thinking that what we're going to want to do, and I'll check another pot too, just to make sure that it isn't yeah, a fluke. Yes, yeah, so there's a little bit more moisture in that pot. Goodness gracious, Doug. Yeah, he's the king. <laughs> he likes everything nice and tidy. All right. So, so I went through and I transferred them from my collective sample into our little sampling cup here. Switch over to nutrients on my blue lab meter here. I go through and put it in. And it's going through and registering at 1.6, which is going to be 0.4 below what we're supplying it with. So, since we had a hard time getting um, nutrient solution come out of the bottom of the buckets, I'm going to tell you to go through and increase your irrigation times. Um, I think you're at a minute right now. Does that sound right? Yep, yep, at a minute every 40 minutes. A minute every 40 minutes. So we can look at this two ways or a combination. We can either decrease the time between irrigations. So we could go from every 40 minutes down to every 30 minutes, or we could go through and increase the time in which the cycle runs. So we could go from a minute to a minute and a half, right? Um, I generally like to run shorter cycles more often. That's what I like to do. Um, and when it's hot in the summertime. Yep, exactly. Because what you end up with is we in the bottom of that bucket, we've only got this two inch reservoir in the bottom of it. And if you've got huge lengths of time between your irrigation cycles, it'll use that up, but then you feel have false sense of confidence because I ran them for five minutes, but I'm only running them for five minutes every hour or two hours. The vast majority of that water just filled up that reservoir and then ran right down your drain line, right? So by running a, a shorter duration, more often we go through, we actually get more water and more nutrients to the plants. So I'll probably tell you to do a combination of both. I'd probably take it up to a minute and a half down to every 30 minutes, run that for a day and then see if you're getting more 
leach coming out of the bucket and if that EC comes up, right? Because what this EC, if we're supplying it with 2.0 and we're getting 1.6 coming out of our drain bucket, that tells you this plant's using everything that we're giving it plus more, right? Because it's diluting that EC down. So we want to see at this stage of the crop, we'd like to see that EC start to build and have that no more than 0.4 um, above your, your supply EC. And uh, yeah, so I'd like to see, before we increase the supply EC, I'd like to see that come up on its own naturally by putting more water to it. And then generally, I don't like to see more than 2.8 as a supply going out here, which would then leave us with our max runoff EC at 3.2. Once we start getting into those three threes, three fours for a runoff EC, that's just an awful lot of salt, lo salt load in the bucket. And if the analogy that I like to use is if you imagine when you were a kid and you took that salt and you sprinkled it on the slug, that salt pulls the moisture out of the slug and kills it, right? And the same thing, even if we've got water or free water in the bucket, those salt levels get so high that their salt wants to be dissolved, right? So it's pulling moisture out of the plant, out of your roots which is then gonna go through and burn those roots, which then opens us up for pathogens, right? Main one that we talk about is Pythium, right? Pythium, if we send a water sample out and send it to a lab, to a plant pathology lab, I can almost guarantee that they're gonna find Pythium, right? So Pythium is always around, it's just an opportunistic fungi, right? So it has to have some sort of lesion in order to go through and get into that plant. And then it takes off like wildfire. So the other analogy that I use is just imagine like bacteria on your skin, right? Our skin acts as that barrier, but when we go through and we get a cut, that bacteria can go through and then inf infiltrate our skin and give us an infection. Same thing with the root. It goes through and it gets damaged. That creates a pathway for these fungi and bacteria to go through and get into the plant. So we basically want to make sure that we keep those salt loads down no more than 0.4 at our supply EC so that we don't end up with those burns. So talking a little bit about nutrient deficiencies, um, when we see purpling in the leaves, that is usually going to be phosphorus and phosphorus deficiency. And normally that is related to cold temperatures because at cooler temperatures, phosphorus becomes less available to the plant. Not that we're not supplying it with enough phosphorus, it's just at those cooler temperatures, the plant can't translocate it up through. And then the other thing that we see a lot in um, greenhouse tomatoes, especially these indeterminate varieties, is this lower leaf yellowing this is going to be magnesium deficiency. And magnesium is what we refer to as a mobile nutrient. So what's going on is the plant is taking the magnesium from the bottom of the plant and moving it to the top of the plant to keep that plant growth good and healthy because this part of the plant is where all the new flowers come from, right? The top part. So it's taking that nutrients from there and putting it up here in greenhouse tomatoes. If we see it in the lower third, we're not too concerned because these plants are basically bred to grow pretty aggressively. So we're just always going to be running into a little bit of magnesium deficiency. So that this little bit of lower leaf yellowing in, in between the veins is totally customary for these greenhouse type tomatoes. And I'm not overly concerned about it. Now, if we start seeing it higher than the bottom third, we would have to have a conversation about supplying these plants with more magnesium. But since it's just down here in the bottom third, I'm not concerned about it. So I really learned a lot today with Nathan coming out. Realized I didn't boost my tomatoes when they needed to be boosted after the third cluster, so he's gonna get me the formula for that. And I didn't have my timer set for enough water for them, so that's why they weren't getting so big, and I was having a little bit of problems with my cucumbers, they weren't so big. And it was really interesting to hear about the nutrient deficiencies and what it does to the leaves, you know, turns them yellow or turns them that purplish color, and what you need to look for. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I learned a lot and hope you did too. So please leave me any comments, suggestions, or questions down below, and I'll see you guys next video.